Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, to today's Nina Interchange series. Um, so today's discussion is brought to you by the Newcastle Hunter Central Coast Hub and also Smart Citizenry. Um, but most importantly, I'd like to start today with an acknowledgement of country. Um, so I'm joining you today from the country of the Awabakal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I always like to start um, Nina events with um, Nina's principle uh, around First Nations people. So we have five principles um, at the New Economy Network. Um, and this is our First Nations principle. So if it's okay with you, I'll read it in full. Um, I think it's really good and it, and it, and it speaks a lot to um, what Nina's all about. Um, so Nina acknowledges that the sovereignty of the First Nations people of the continent, now known as Australia, was never ceded by treaty, nor in any other way. Nina acknowledges and respects First Nations people's laws and ecologically sustainable custodianship of Australia over tens of thousands of years through land and sea management practices that continue today. Nina also acknowledges and respects the ancient earth-centered steady state economic system that was created and managed by First Nations people across the continent for millennia. Australian society is in debt to First Nations people for many aspects of the modern economy. Thank you. Okay, so just a little introduction. So um, I know we've got quite a few Nina members here today, so you know all about Nina, but anyone that hasn't participated with um, Nina before, so um, we're the New Economy Network Australia. Um, we've been functional as a cooperative for about um, 18 months, two years now. Um, so basically what we are, we're a network of individuals and organisations. Um, we operate all across Australia from um, different sectors, different regions. Um, and our primary goal um, is to transform Australia's economic system. Um, and what do we want that transformation to look like? So basically it's about prioritising ecological health and social justice um, over profit in a nutshell. Um, and then there's a few principles that we work by to give you a bit of a sense, and that's ecological sustainability, social justice, democracy, place-based and emphasising local um, and First Nations people. And that was that principle that I just read out for you. Um, so how does Nina do this? Um, so we are really what we try to do is build networks, connections and shared initiatives. Um, so we do that um, within what we call hubs um, that work quite semi-autonomously. Um, and then we have geographic hubs and we have sectoral hubs. Um, so today the initiative is being brought to you by the Newcastle Hunter Central Host Hub, um, hub but we also work really closely with lots of different hubs across Australia, our other regional hubs and our other sectoral hubs um, to bring things together in a systematic way. Um, so what you're joining is our new interchange series. Um, so throughout the, the rest of the year, be it online or in person, when we can meet in person, um, we're gonna be running a series um, of webinars and events where we share um, knowledge, ideas and initiatives. Um, and that's all about bringing us together and sharing and sort of evolving this discussion about a new economy. Um, but we're going to be pairing that with these with a strategy series and I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. Um, so today's discussion, as I said, is hosted by our hub. Um, and I think I just realised I didn't mention who I was, but um, I'm Megan and I'm part of Nina. Um, I'm a director, but I also convene our local um, regional hub. Um, so now I'd like to hand you over to um, Moira, my amazing co-host for today. Um, and Moira is with Smart Citizenry, our co-host organisation. And so she'll introduce herself and, and explain a little bit about Smart Citizenry. Um, and then she'll take us through um, the program and the plan for today. Sounds Thanks. Good? Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Thanks Megan. Moira. Really lovely, lovely to see all your faces. Uh, it's fabulous. I really appreciate you um, making some time for um, being together with us and for us to have the opportunity to be together with all of you. Um, so as Megan said, uh, this is being brought to you by Nina and also Smart Citizenry. In the chat, I've put the uh, URL to both Nina and Smart Citizenry. 
And Megan and I also work together um, in ethical fields, which is another initiative. So essentially that what binds all of these things together is a common desire for collaboration, cooperation, connection, which is exactly what today's conversation is about. And also to see how we can um, be the midwives to the new economy to serve the people and our environment as best we possibly can. So um, Smart Citizenry grew out of an initiative um, through COVID and after we had some talk about creating tracking devices and internet platforms and heavens knows what, we went to old fashioned technology of just creating a little form which you could download and put in your neighbour's letterbox. Because when we actually did the investigation about what was most needed and what was being called for at this time, was that the people that we felt would be most isolated through the COVID experience were people who were at home, particularly elderly people um, and people who were living on their own. And it seemed to us that there was a fairly good chance when we looked at some very basic data and talked to each other, that we knew that a lot of those people would not necessarily have access to all the devices or mobile things. So we went old school. And uh, we weren't the only ones uh, all around the country, all around the world, in fact. Within about um, 10 days in the UK, there were over um, something like 800 mutual aid groups popping up everywhere. So we know that um, community uh, is called for and where it's strong and already exists in times like this, in pandemics and under natural disasters, uh, we know that that's what keeps communities thriving and enabling them to take the next steps they need to take together. And coming off the bushfires in, in Australia, and particularly in my part of the world, so I live on the Flurio Peninsula, and it's really nice to see some fellow Flurio people there. Hello, Becky. Um, it, because we know that, and all the data supports this, that even in, even in horrific environments like a bushfire, communities who are connected to one another are the ones that thrive and survive. There's a fabulous example in, from the Kangaroo Island bushfires where a couple of the local, uh, what would be called hoons, got young men who were running around with their fast cars and doing donuts and being a general pest to many of their neighbours on the, uh, when things were getting really hairy, um, uh, they were the young men that also went in and literally pulled people out of their houses, put them in the back of their ute, uh, threw the dogs in, chickens, all sorts of things. They're now kind of uh, local heroes. And um, in any other environment, those people would have perished, let alone their um, animals and some of their land. So, um, and there's plenty of international evidence to suggest that even in those kind of situations, floods and fires, uh, being well connected means someone knows that there's someone in that house or around the corner. And uh, it's fabulous. So we thought, um, Megan and I were talking about how to help amplify the voices and share some of the learning that's going on. And uh, so we've invited a few people to share what they're actually doing in their own communities um, and how they're doing it. But before we get to that, I'm just wondering if in the chat, you wouldn't mind um, just saying um, your name and perhaps where you're from, what, what your location is. So we can get a bit of a sense of who's, who's here um, in, in the room and everyone can get to see that. So as I said, I'm on Ghana country at Selix Beach, um, Wadawali and in South Australia, and let's have a look at where are the rest of you from, if you wouldn't mind just throwing it into the chat, uh, just your name and where you're from. Um, Becky's on Ghana land too, in McLaren Vale. We've got Hail from the Central Coast. Welcome. Keep them coming. Great, Newcastle of Aka land. Sarah's in uh, Warami land. Welcome, Sarah. She's one of our guests later on. Jen in the Central Coast, Lake Macquarie. Great. Thank you, everyone. Keep them coming. It's a great way of everyone getting to see who you are and where you're from. Because being placed is very important and it's at the centre of what this um, we're going to be talking about today. Fabulous. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. So um, we've got... Um, I think we've got Dana on the line. She's going to wave wildly so everyone knows who she is. Can you give us a wave? And Mark and Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think we've got um, Christy by the look of it, but let me just see. I don't think so. I'm having to go over a couple of screens. Okay. So um, I'm going to be um, interviewing uh, you all, those three of you. Thank you very much. 
And we've got a few questions and you can see those questions um, Megan's put up on the slide, but I might actually ask um, us to just have the whole screen so we can uh, get to see each other. If in the course of um, the conversation, you have a question for any of the panelists, please put it in the chat. Megan's gonna keep an eye on the chat because she'll be hosting the Q&A a bit up towards the end of the session. So uh, please um, hang on to your question and then we'll get them all at the end. So um, I'm gonna start with Dana. And if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and saying a little bit about the group and how you came to be in this conversation today. Thanks, Moira. I'm Dana Bell, I'm from Adelaide. Um, I wouldn't say I'm, an, oh, I'm not an expert in community development, so I'm here from a, a really grassroots, this is what I'm doing in my own local community um, perspective. I've known Moira for some time, so what inspired me has been uh, watching Moira and other people. Becky, we haven't met personally, but I know of the work you do as well. So I've been kind of watching from the sidelines and stepping in in response to other people starting initiatives. So this is my first time of really taking the lead to inspire other people in my own local community. So inspired by other people who are known for their work in community development. Um, and then more recently, with uh, I'm not sure Christy's on the line yet, but um, in the work that Christy had been doing in her suburb, which is neighboring to mine. Um, yeah. Do you want to just say what your suburb is and um, just a little weeny bit about the group itself? Sure. So I'm in Clarence Gardens, which is the inner southern suburbs of Adelaide. Um, the group, as in the Facebook group, do you mean? Yeah. Um, so one of the first steps I did was to create a local Facebook group. We're up to, um, I think, over 100 people in, it feels like a long time, but it's only been two or three weeks. Um, and it's grown pretty quickly and organically. Um, and we've probably got another 20 or 30 people who haven't answered the membership question, so they haven't been accepted <laughs> into the group yet. Um, but they're all, our suburb is quite a big suburb. Um, what I've noticed is the people who have um, joined the Facebook group are sort of one part of the suburb. So it's where we've had physical flyers in letterboxes to let people know about the Facebook group and then people, neighbours who they know. So even though it's a big suburb, I've noticed that the people who have joined the group are from one part of it. Do you want to just say a little bit about how the group started? Yeah, so I saw the Smart Citizenry um, letterbox drop form that um, Smart Citizenry had developed. So I did I'd, I'd, we'd put a teddy bear in the window and a couple of other, yeah, I think a teddy bear in the window and um, had spoken to our immediate neighbours on either side. And the first step I really took was to, um, at the same time, create the Facebook group and do a letter drop, letter box drop, which had two pieces of paper. One was the, um, the help and need flyer. And the other thing was a flyer uh, about the Facebook group itself. So it started because um, I, I knew some of, my neighbours but not very well only like a couple of my neighbours fairly well um, and it took me putting myself out there and having my contact details and using the smart citizenry flyer I think that was really the stimulus that we're all wired to connect so once I'd taken that step people were responding and um, and joining pretty quickly after that and then in, later on we can talk about some of the other things we're doing but it really started with simultaneously with the flyer and um, about offering help and also um, advertising the Facebook group and putting Excellent. it on my front fence and decorating my post box and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dana. We're going to go to another part of the country now and I'm going to welcome Sarah into the conversation. And Sarah, do you want to say a little bit about yourself, who you are, your group and how you got started? Cool. Uh, I'm Sarah. Um, I've been involved with community politics since I was a child. Um, and more so since I was about 15, so over 30 years ago. And um, I sit currently in Mullumbimba in, in Newcastle on the estuary part, so kind of where Waramayama and Wagapul people's lands meet. And I'd just like to honour these peoples and my, my ability to be here and also honour my own ancestors that accompany me in this space. Um, I cut across different communities so I work a lot with indigenous and decolonizing 
work in community. I sit also in a university. I'm a poet. Um, I'm a popular educator. I'm a mother. Um, and I uh, have a long history in community organizing and around, I guess, a bro broad uh, concept such as mutual aid and coming from autonomous um, traditions um, and community organizing in Latin America, but also in Europe and particularly in London and Nottingham and then in parts of Colombia and Venezuela, where there was a big, there are big traditions of communities kind of coming to organize new forms of authority and power and forms of economy that are really respectful to country. Oh, madre tierra, sorry, my little ones in here. Um, care in an expanded sense of the word and community and who really center the everyday and really center ordinary people as potential authors in their own futures and in making decisions and having wisdoms about what our economy and society and polity should look like. Um, and so it was from that confluence really and, and already working with trying to build the seeds of decolonizing and, and feminized feminist practice that um, I could read what was going to happen. Like I had lots of people in Europe and sorry, I've been going on here. <laughs> lots of people in Europe and lots of people in the States and in Italy who were ahead of us. So I could kind of tell that this was going to come here a few weeks beforehand. And, um, I also realized that already there was a lot of precarity so that already there are many many people who are struggling with you know contract work or who are struggling with new layers of, of poverty and impoverishment and of vulnerability so I just have to lift up a box wait <laughs> I'm just gonna lift up the wall I'm still here There's a box. <laughs> with isolation so, so with fragmentation. So I was very aware that that was the social terrain at the same time as I was also very aware that the state has a very ambiguous relationship with opening possibilities for alternatives of the economy and polity that recognise and that are based in community care and country. And so I was kind of really mindful about both the public health side of potential state interventions but also the authoritarian side of state interventions that would close space and that would augment our fragmentation so the idea for the newcastle mutual aid during the coronavirus was very much a way to go it was on virtual because i'm higher risk so i can't physically be out in the community but other people are for example and it was a way to try and create a kind of network and a net um, where we could find ways and complex ways to learn about each other and to express our needs to listen um, and it was very much an emphasis so then some people joined me to help administer, administer it on um, multiplicity so kind of the high idea that there are many ways that we can think of mutual aid and there are many things that need to be taken seriously. So people sending memes to each other that bring laughter is serious because of people's mental, you know, because of where we're at. People sharing cooking is, is serious, is political. Um, people needing needs of food delivery or stuff to do with housing is serious. Organizing tenants associations, people organizing their own, their own mini localized mutual aids in particular um, suburbs. So it was that openness that I think was very important for me and then the people who I've been working with on that admin to maintain so not closing it off and narrowing it to something or some position. Thanks Sarah that's fabulous I really appreciate bringing the broader context and also the global perspective into this. Um, we're going to go to Mark now do you want to introduce yourself Mark who you are and how what you're doing and how you came to be doing it? Sure so my name's Mark Reeson. I live in Coromona Valley in the Adelaide Hills uh, with my wife and three children who are now back at school, which is a great relief. Um, and 
I've got about 20 years of experience in working in community engagement. I've done no training in community development, but it's all kind of learning on the road kind of stuff. And the main context for that has been advocacy and support locally and nationally for asylum seekers and refugees. So that has taught me a lot about um, community need and community engagement. I also have a community engagement role um, in a state denominational office here in Adelaide um, and teach at Table College and I teach a community engagement subject there. Um, I facilitate a group called Love Your Neighbour South Australia COVID-19 um, Inspired Community Connections. It's a very long title I know um, but uh, I didn't come up with the idea. Uh, a friend of mine, Jessica Gardner, who is actually in this Zoom conversation, I'm, I'm going to embarrass you, Jessica. Don't know if she's listening right now, but um, she, <laughs> she, she actually started in Melbourne um, back in the middle of March. Much and uh, and I contacted her and I said, look, I've, I've been doing some work in this area and I'd love to start up a group in South Australia. So we did. And within 24 hours, we had media contacting us and uh, over a thousand members and it kind of really took off. So uh, across all of our Love Your Neighbour groups around Australia, and there's a number of them, uh, we have about 20,000 members um, and it's been a steep learning curve for both Jessica and I to learn how to moderate and administer those groups. Um, and we'll talk about that later if you like. But um, uh, there's also a couple of groups in San Francisco and London uh, out of some podcasts that I've done. And um, so it's been good to see what's what's been inspired. What inspired me to get involved actually was a week before Jessica started the group. My brother um, s sent me a message saying he was looking for toilet paper and um, he couldn't find it anywhere. He must have sent that message uh, to his neighbour as well because he sent me a photo later that day. Um, with a pack of toilet paper on his doorstep and said his neighbour uh, rose to the call. And I was asked to speak at a church um, a day after that and I used that uh, uh, image to lead the conversation because I was actually asked to come and speak about how to be a good neighbour. So the environment was already primed for me to want to start up a group like this and so I just leant into it very naturally um, so that when I saw Jessica's group pop up, I said, I want to be a part of that. I'll facilitate a group in South Australia and it just took off. Thanks, Mark. And, and while we're with you, I might um, ask you the next question. So, cool. uh, which is really about, um, you know, what have you noticed in terms of what are the observations you made, maybe some positive, negative ones, or just, just your general noticings about what's been happening with Love Your Neighbour and, and what happens um, at a group level, but also what are some, some of the things you might be even noticing personally in terms of your own leadership? Yeah, I, I've i noticed that um, what's come through this group is the exaggeration of underlying issues that are already in our society. So isolation is one of those. Um, but also the exaggeration of other underlying gifts in our society like goodwill. So um, it, it's interesting to see how how rapidly everything kind of came to um, this 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 pinpoint of um, everyone's anxiety coming together in one place. And there were some really good things that came out of that, but there's some been some really challenging things that have come out of that as well in terms of our leadership of the groups. So we've had to fairly heavily moderate because some posts and comments that pop up on groups aren't always all that helpful coming out of people's anxieties uh, and when the group grows rapidly um, it, you have to really stay on top of that uh, but now the group kind of self-manages and I've noticed that there's some really good stuff coming out of this so our my my agenda is not to um, get people into a Facebook group but actually to connect people with their local neighbours so I, I heard a couple of you talk about that um, a card that you drop into a letterbox. I picked up on that. Someone shared that in our group very early on. So I used that practice in my own street. We already had connection with about a quarter of 
the people in our street, we've now got connection with about 70% of the people in our street, it's about 25 households. And I started getting messages from people saying uh, how much they needed that contact because they had felt isolated. Um, but I've seen some fantastic stories pop up in our Facebook page as well, just people using this as an opportunity to reach out to their neighbour and start a walking group or um, or cook a meal for their neighbour. So it's actually tapped into some things that are pre-existing in our community, and that is there is goodwill in our community. This has provided a, a forum for people to connect. It's like a repository for information and, um, and offers and help. And uh, it's kind of just been self perpetuating now. We, we don't try and control the information that, that, that goes in that group. It's whatever people feel they want to um, share that is relevant to love your neighbor um, guidelines. Uh, it goes in there. Thanks, Mark. Dana, I know that this is all really brand news to you. So as a newbie, um, into the whole world while well, Mark's had lots of community experience. Um, what, what are you noticing in your group? What are the things that you're observing, um, both positives and negatives? You're on mute. It's definitely been more positive than negative. So the first thing was it took that one act of doing a letterbox drop to inspire a lot of people to like, literally come out of their homes. <laughs> Um, so it was very quick where the small things I started to notice was people actually stopping to chat in the street more rather than just waving or saying nothing and keep going. Um, I've noticed that it's both men and women, not that I had really any preconceived ideas about that, but it was some, something someone said earlier, I probably would have assumed it would have been more women stepping forward than men and that hasn't been my experience. Um, and I've been asking in the chats around what does it mean to be a good neighbour and there are some pretty consistent things that are coming out of that, which it doesn't mean from what my group is, our group is saying, it's not living in each other's pockets. It's small things like acknowledging each other, looking out for one another's physical properties and for each other. Um, and there are probably two stories I can share that really stuck out, st have stuck out for me. One is, um, and she just walked, passed as we were on this call and I waved. Um, so we, um, I put together some rainbow packs of um, things that people could decorate their fences and their homes with. So we've got about six or eight homes that are fully decked out with rainbows. And one of the things I've noticed is people stopping with their small children out the front and uh, even teaching their kids colours based on the different rainbows on the fence. And then they, we wave at the windows. And then there's a, a collaborative thing across the road where um, it's a big hedge and there, there's a big sign A to Z. Uh, each day there is a new insect which has been uh, corresponding to that letter of the alphabet which is planted in the fence. So you, I'm noticing people of all ages interacting with that. It's not just the kids. Um, and also... Um, yeah, even though it started as a Facebook group, the intent was always to, that that was a springboard, that it was always about connecting people in the real world. So um, people have loved doing uh, drinks on the verge and we had our little local Anzac day. And it, the interesting thing has been uncovering the assets that we have in this community. So that somebody um, served in the military, so he led the whole Anzac day thing and everybody really... Um, appreciated that so I guess what I've, I've noticed there is it's beyond the people's people's day jobs who you may you may have known what they did it's unlocking all of these other things other skills and experiences that people have have had that they're bringing to the community um, thank you yeah, I think I said, it. thank you very much I'm um, unlocking the assets I think is a fabulous um, descriptor of what uh, lots and lots of people are noticing um, it just and which is kind of a contradiction in a time of isolation. Sarah, what's, what are you noticing? What's, what are you observing about your mutual aid group, the positives and negatives? Um, I guess maybe because it's mutual aid, it's under a mutual aid banner, um, and there's particular traditions that it sits within, and, and we're part of a bigger network of like mutual aid 
across the globe because there's some directory being set up of all mutual aid. What I've noticed is that a lot of people who have been have been involved with setting up and administering both ours and the local one in in here, the suburb I uh, sit in. And these offshoot local ones have also been set up and the sharing of resources, how to do that. And then in other spaces, like in Sydney, is that it's often feminized and racialized folks who are at the heart of it. So it's been a lot of mothers. It's been a lot of queer and trans folk. And it's been a lot of, and then indigenous or race folk who are actually suffering some of the kind of harshest elements, both prior to COVID and now in COVID with the kind of forms of um, disparity in terms of access to state rights or the disparities in terms of policing by the state and stuff so there's definitely a kind of feminized thing that in terms of the subjects or racialized subjects but also in the modes of of organizing so there's there is an emphasis i would i feel on care and there is a emphasis on, on multiplicity so there's a really big ethic like we put in our little thing about what it's about on kind of listening and kind of this learning from each other and this peer sort of learning and listening. And it takes loads of different forms from, you know, sharing things like the kind of letter you can put into people's letterbox to international news about what's happening medically or to international news about an analysis of what's going on with the state right now. So there's all these multiple levels to kids, you know, materials for those of us are homeschooling. So there's all these levels going on. And I've, I've seen a lot of creativity, like mega creativity like people's capacity to go right we're just going to set us up in these streets and we're going to see what this goes this is what I can give this is what I need and so I think it's it's what I really like about the, the space we have is it's not just we can all give to these needy people it's like we also have need so there's this combination it's not that kind of pink paternalistic model it's I feel that what I'm seeing is a much more kind of horizontal um, I think there's an emergent sense that this is political. I think that's often not named. I think it's seen as kind of everyday social helping, whereas I, I think the, the, the idea and the narrative that actually this is a source of, of autonomy and creativity and collective power for whatever it is we have to navigate in Newcastle in our, you know, in our suburbs and, and across the country is, is emergent. Um, but I think there's, you know, lots of discussion and sharing to be have about other uh, traditions of how we situate what we're doing and what's emergent at the moment. Um, I've also found because it wasn't online, even though these things have sprouted off that are, you know, delivering stuff or, you know, doing stuff in the physical is there's a disjuncture though. So I find that there's a disjuncture in terms of access and non-access to that space. And particularly those who don't have access to official channels as well of support. Um, and it, it strikes me that, that that needs to take other forms than they has. So some of the people in Food Not Bombs in, in Newcastle, who I love, I think they're great. I think they're fascinating what they're doing because they politicize the everyday as an act of we should all have food and they share food and there's a little free kind of shop and space in, in one of our suburbs. But they also link that to broader struggles. So they also link how our lack or certain people's lack of food and the commodification of food is also linked to high incarceration rates of our indigenous kin in this land and how we can we need to free our kin so that there's not mass dying as there is in other parts of the world in in the in the prison system so there's this and they and they combine that and i for me that's been a really fascinating kind of part of this multiplicity to see that that linking in the physical, in the virtual, and in the narratives that surround what the importance, right, the kernel of something other that emerges in our everyday struggles and in our everyday creativity. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. The creativity piece um, and the personal being political, I think I'm definitely seeing around the world. Um, some of you may know the work of uh, Policy Link in the US who are doing quite a lot around the relationship between race and COVID-19. Um, I'll pop that uh, just into the chat so people can see about it um, because of the, you know, the death rate, um, particularly around non-white um, US citizens. 
So, um, yeah, I think the threads are definitely at the global. This is a beautiful example of the um, global and the local. It's not all the local, it's the both. And um, bringing in our, you know, the mega trends that are impacting and nothing like a pandemic to make all those things very visible. Um, we're going to ask one last question and I'll actually start with Sarah, so if she doesn't mind. And that is about what are we noticing now? What are the outcomes that have happened from this time that we'd really like to see continuing post COVID? Um, there's a yearning for not going back to normal. And it, it's sometimes fainter than at other times, but I feel there's a palpability there. I think there's a recognition of, of a double recognition because we've already gone through it with all the fires, right? But a double recognition of our, our, our capacities and creativity and ability to actually manage and organize and distribute resources and knowledge when the state abandons us or when it's there partially, yeah? And to take our own decisions about what, what the state and the government say to us. Um, I think... Um, there is in terms of future post covid i think this not return to normal is really important to really stress and to really build upon the seeds that have been planted in our experiences of mutual aid or of sharing or of kindness to neighbors or the multiplicity of forms that we call this and we name this and how we've weaved this together um to build on that to build on those relationships and to um almost start to map, you know, be our own researchers about our, in a broadest sense, because I think often the university, and I see in a university is paid labor, but often that actually is the opposite of what is our useful knowledge, right? But actually map that together and, and share knowledges and share experiences um, and really centering the everyday, I think is important and a, and a kind of politics of care and that this is political, who eats, who has community and relationships, you know, who has access to resources, whether that's, you know, online or other, it, it, these are all really deeply political questions, mental health, trauma, deeply political questions, right? Um, uh, I, I think it would be really lovely then to have more shared story and narratives and more of centering of First Nations and black communities that is present and there's parallel things going on and, and there's stuff, but I think kind of the centering of already the resiliences and the knowledges of dealing with crisis, because there's an ongoing crisis all the time, pre, prior, post, is actually really important to remember and to remind ourselves of, of the importance of that. Um, and I, I actually really, the kinds of things I've learned about Newcastle, so food, not bombs and what they're doing, I really want to go when I can out of this and go and chop potatoes and have political discussions with them and go and sit on a Wednesday and share the food I think it's absolutely beautiful and it reminds me of stuff that I've been involved with in other lands and I think something I'm hearing in my sector is this thing of like oh because it's such a crisis we've got to sacrifice some people we've got to sacrifice some jobs you know that that's what we have to do and I think the mutual aid stuff is really clearly saying that's not the case we don't agree with that. We believe everybody should be part of this and we believe there should be sanctuary for all and dignity for all. And I think that's super powerful because I'm hearing this and I'm seeing there in meetings going, oh my God, sacrificing some people, are you, are you serious? No. So I think that's also really important to pull out. Yeah, sanctuary for all. You know, you don't, we're not leaving anybody behind anymore. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Jada, how about you? What is it that you, the outcomes from this time? And maybe you want to um, take a, a deep dive into your own community and your own neighbourhood. What is it that you hope you'll be able to continue post this time? So I'm confident that we've laid a really good foundation. And if we think about the awareness of each other and starting to build some trust. And the other story I wanted to share was something that happened in the last couple of weeks. So after this work had started that, um, and we wouldn't have had the outcomes of what happened after unless we had created this, started to work, create this community in a different way, is um, one of the neighbours was going for a jog and actually passed away across the road from my place. Mm -hmm. And so we, there were a lot of, it was like five o'clock in the morning and we were looking out of the windows and we could see that 
ambulance was there and everything and no one actually knew who it was or what had happened. And we, we wouldn't have known unless we had established those connections. And then we kind of found out that it was somebody on our block. And what it meant is that we were able to wrap around the, the woman who the surviving widow to make her to, so she knew that she was supported by her local community as well as her other friends and family and people have been dropping food over. And when she walks up and down the street, and stands near where her husband passed away. We're, we're, we're conscious of that, so we are taking extra care. So the reason I share this story is, if we hadn't known met each other the way that we know each other now, number one, we probably wouldn't have even been aware. Number two, we wouldn't have um, been able to respond in the way that we did. And I think it links to something I, I forgot to say in the first part of what I've observed is that people are going out of their natural comfort zones. Yes, it's still on some levels, it's still pretty um, surface level, you know, social and let's decorate our homes and have a drink in the, in the street and it's quite social. And people are behaving in a way that they wouldn't have behaved before. So that is an example of when Jeff died in our street, how we have been able to connect and respond to support Kath in our neighbourhood. So I, what I hope as a result of all of this is that people, will, we will move beyond having confidence that Clarence Gardens is a great place to live, you know, it's nice looking, it's close to everything, da, 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 to having confidence in the people in our suburb and in our community as well. And that my hope is that we'll deepen those connections and, and build from this foundation of trust. Thanks, Dana. Um, I think you are well and truly off your L plates in this work. <laughs> Mark, what about you? Um, some comments about the positive outcomes and what you hope will continue post COVID. Yeah, it's really timely, uh, this question, because Jessica posted on the Melbourne Love Your Neighbour group this morning, and I also posted it on the South Australia group. Um, what's your post ISO attitude, behaviour, rhythm, or learning that you want to keep going? And along with that, I posted a question, um, has loving your neighbour taken on new meaning for you? Um, it's certainly taken on new meaning for me because I probably had more conversations with neighbours in my local area over this last month than I have over this last year. And I don't want that habit to change. Um, when, when our group first started up, I posted uh, a... a a comment a day which I call a community posture that I wanted people to be able to consider and adopt it was just a paragraph reflection um, 10 reflections over 10 days and to summarize that I would say if we are able to approach our neighbors with open hands and learn to trust one another that there are resources among us that we're able to share and receive then that's a good outcome if we're able to, uh, and really inspired listening to Sarah, if we're able to develop empathy for one another to the point where we can actually share in community lament about that which is not just, and also to be able to step into the gap where the injustice needs to be addressed, then I think that is a posture that we can take on, that we can develop eyes of compassion to look at one another as if we can see ourselves and our neighbour and want the best for them. I think those are really good postures that all of us can adopt. We don't need to be a, a community leader or, or need a government organisation to do it for us. Actually, everyone who has a neighbour can do that and we can develop an awareness for our Indigenous neighbours, for our homeless neighbours, for our refugee neighbours, for all of those who are missing out, who are um, people who are actually coming to the forefront of our minds now because we are becoming more aware of those who have not and we yeah. are people who have things that we can offer. So I hope that, and that's why I've been so inspired to see all of these Love Your Neighbour inspired groups pop up all over the place in South Australia. We've got one in the Riverland, one in the Filario Peninsula, one in York Peninsula, who are kind of all going off and kind of form their own identities now. And, um, and the whole point of this is that we will be able to localise our neighbourhood connections so that beyond this, uh, where we're able to meet with one another again and we're able to have larger groups and all of that, that we'll be able to meet um, face to face physically and continue to support and help one another. Thanks, Mark. 
Um, thank you too for people who are putting questions into the chat. I really appreciate it. So this is a question for the panel. Um, and that's, this one comes from Becky, Becky Hurst, who has a long history in being in community work, um, particularly working for clients who perhaps are uh, in organised way, like they are organised, the clients, well, maybe they're wanting to talk to people who are not so organised, like the community. Um, she's got a question here about that for a long time, it feels like the government, state, local or federal have been taking quite a paternalistic attitude or approach and have been around, you know, have gone orientating themselves in a consulting way for decisions to be made. I'm wondering if you as a panel have any thoughts on how traditional decision makers, so those who are, I would say, authorised through some power relationship like a vote, and um, Becky's nodding, so I think that's what she meant. Um, how, how, what advice might we have to them about how they could think differently, given we've had this grand swell of community connectedness and leadership? And I would say that that's not just been through the pandemic. I think we saw it very strongly as well um, at the beginning of the year um, through all the bushfires as well. So Mark or Dana or Sarah, if you've got a comment about that, how, what advice should we be given from our grassroots experience um, to those in political or formal decision-making power institution. I can talk to that a little bit, but okay. <laughs> might be a bit contrary. But um, I can work a lot with local forms of democracy and reimagining democracy in the 20th century, 21st century. Like a lot of my practice is around that because I sit in politics and. Um, uh, uh, historically, I would say that the powers that be don't listen unless um, like ordinary people are organised and uh, developed and deepened collective solidarities, collective relationships, collective modes of being and doing and producing differently or social reproduction, you know, in terms of like health or housing or, or food or care um, and have developed shared narratives of some kind. Um, with which to actually posit a, a, almost like an agenda or another vision or another story that can guide what the hell we think politics is and democracy is. So I think my focus right now would, is to continue to build that. Um, I, d I, don't, I, I don't think there's, um, I wouldn't be directing my focus on the politicians and powers that be right now in terms of my kind of political practice and my critical practice and I've often found in, in other experiences in, in, in where I've kind of engaged with community organizing is that you'll get kind of someone sitting in the state in the local state who becomes an ally who, who emerges from movements and that then opens these possibilities for often tension ridden alliances around particular strategies I saw James put about strategies so around particular things like defend this piece of land or allow for a community occupation of a piece of land so that they can then farm it and, and work it in a different way. I would say that we have to be mindful that when we talk of politics we talk of power and that I'm very into a politics of love and decolonizing love and of connection but there is conflict too. And, and there is increasing, there's already lots of violence emergent from the state and, and it has historically and in con the, continu the continued period, the way that the fining has been mapped out, you know, it's hit poorer, raced indigenous communities, uh, more than kind of whiter middle class communities, even though there were higher rates in, in those communities of, of um, the virus. So I just think we I would be really mindful of that. I think the eyes <laughs> to develop that that kind of um, vision together. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks, it's, pretty, it's pretty important right now. Um, there's a couple more questions here and I'm not conscious of the time. And one, there's a question here about, are you noticing, and this is for the panel, um, or witnessing any shift um, like things starting to drop off as a result of the, the virus now time coming to a, a, you know, some kind of, not a con complete end, but you notice any, any changes around engagement around that? And also, the, what do you think the difference, and this might be a good question for you, Mark, given you teach in this field, the difference between community engagement and community development. So do you want to, do you want to speak to that? 
Um, I'm not sure if I know enough about community development, but um, I would say community engagement is really, it, it, and I would say this in response to politicians as well, um, develop a listening ear for what can be responded to. Um, I, I think we are far too um, anxious to get back to what was or to come up with solutions or to impose something very quickly. And I would just be saying, slow down and listen. That would be probably my best advice. So when it comes to community engagement, my posture has always been listen to what's going on around, what's already happening, join in with it. I think there is some more um, kind of front foot proactivity when it comes to community development and it's project based, but I think community engagement is about listening to the people and what's going on and what can we respond to that's constructive. And are you noticing any shift in the behaviour of the groups um, as the pandemic starting to wane? Yeah, definitely. I was saying this to Jessica this morning. Um, in the first few weeks of our group, we had something like 38,000 posts and comments. In the last 28 days, we've had 4,500. So there's been a drop off of engagement on the um, online platform. Um, I think there's a number of reasons for that. You know, when there's something new and, and there's some kind of, you know, rapid response to something, people kind of really respond very quickly and there's there's lots of activity. Um, but I'm noticing that there's a drop off in the activity. You know, things are starting to open up. The resources are more readily available to the community now. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that we can still harness the goodwill and say, um, how do we now continue to develop an awareness for our neighbours that continues this goodwill towards our neighbours, even if we don't need to provide resources for one another all the time. Thank you. And another one for the panel, and then I'm going to hand back to um, Megan. So this is your opportunity to try have a one minute answer to this question, which is of course the equivalent of five PhDs. So really challenging for you. Are you, are you witnessing and engaging in or noticing any kind of consensus building that actually takes people to take on specific challenges or specific social changes that they want? Sarah, do you want to have a go at that? Any, are you noticing seeing consensus um, building? Well, you know, I am like I. So I'm also in the education sector, so it does sit with with this mutual aid because lots of the people are in the mutual aid or in other mutual aids across different places, and I'm noticing activity like a groundswell of something picking up about defending livelihoods, defending dignity, defending jobs, ensuring some sense of the public. I'm I'm absolutely like, and it has different contents and meanings. So I'm seeing that. I'm, I'm really seeing that. So it's really interesting. Just outside, there was these uh, beepings of horns and some bikes because they did a May Day. And this was like crisscross with our mutual aid group and then two women who are in it, but also who obviously doing other things as well. And um, and it was it was this these beautiful connections. So there's also a taking, because I think the real issue we're having, right, is that we can't really be in the public together. We can't sit and touch each other in that kind of way right which has always been so so fundamental to our capacity to listen to each other and learn together and, and come up with pathways forward and but there's these inventive ways of disrupting that isolation in ways that are still safe and are really mindful of the vulnerable so that social ethic but that is also bringing out a visibility and is bringing back aliveness to the outside as well as feeding that back in the inside so i think um there's something there there's something awoken now of course there's no guarantee that that yeah. continues but i do think what was said by gotta come associate with names what's his name mark about slowness I mean, it's, it's a bit shit in the sense the state is moving fast, power is moving fast, capital moves bloody fast, and we need to take our time and we need to have sensitivity and listening. So there's a bit of a disjuncture there. Nevertheless, I can't see this. That is a way of not going back to normal, like refusing. Screw it. I'm not going to work all day at home. No, I've got my kids here. 
I'm actually going to focus on how to learn to grow these herbs, you know, and I'm going to focus on listening to the story that that woman posted on the, on the, on the, the group, or I'm going to, you know, focus on other forms with which we can make connections. And, um, I really think that's key actually. Um, we, yeah. And it builds up a rhythm and it builds up momentum. It's powerful, but it's a different form of power, right? Yeah, I, I think, thanks, Sarah. And Dana, I think the example of consensus um, and social action was really visible in your story about Anzac Day. Um, who would have thought um, that that would be, a, and that was just all over the country, people were doing things. I was getting messages of saying, I can hear a bagpipe, someone else had a saxophone, someone had a bugle. So um, I think that the creativity and the consensus building and then the public visibility. Is there anything else you've noticed in your Facebook group, Dana, that, Dana about that? Another you know, example? I think to your point, Anzac Day was probably, um, that was a great example because it wasn't, most of the other thing, organised things that have happened have been sort of on my block and these houses around on our stretch of the street but Anzac Day was really the first example of it wasn't just our street it was people had organized their own things um, and in the Facebook chats people were there was one comment specifically this is something that I hope we keep doing after you know the COVID scenario has changed so um, I, I don't have much more to add um, other than I don't think I'm really excited that we're at, at this foundation and I've really valued listening to everybody else as well because it gets me thinking about how what our, our next steps we can we can take in our community as well and, and some of the you. discussions to start. Thank you. We're nearly at our appointed time, so I'm going to hand back to Megan. Um, there is a, There are more questions and comments and some dialogue going on in the chat. Um, if you want to keep the chat, there is a mechanism for doing that, um, which I hope Megan is going to be able to enable, and then that make that available for anyone with the recording. Um, I'm going to hand back to her, but I just want to, um, for those of you who haven't actually got your visual on, if you want to just pop your video on, if you can, that would be wonderful, just for a few seconds so we can see all your beautiful faces. And then I'm going to um, ask you to do a thank you to the panel um, by waving your hands around like this. So can we all thank the panel? So they can all see you thanking them. And I'm going to hand back to Megan to close off the call. Thank you so much, panel and Moira and everyone that joined. Um, my thought a few minutes ago was when I started to organise um, this particular series, you know, it's quite two dimensional for a long time. You're sending emails, you're kind of creating poster images and creating a Zoom. Um, and I feel like I've just had this like 10 dimensional experience um, with everyone here and the descriptions. And you took me right to your, um, you took me right to your neighbourhood. You took me right to your street, um, to those different moments. Um, you know, I was smelling the cooking that Sarah was talking about. Yeah, so fabulous. Um, really great talk. Um, I'll just check back in now with, um, just to leave you with a little bit of information. Um, actually, before I share that, Sarah, would you please like to take one minute? Um, so the next webinar in our series um, is going to be hosted by um, Sarah. Sarah, would you just like to take a second just to explain briefly? We haven't locked in a date for this yet. It's probably going to be in about two to three weeks time. But this might be a great way for anyone here um, that's interested, Sarah, to join um, that webinar. So can you just one minute on what, what that topic's going to be about? Okay. <laughs> it's called Feminist Feminized Readings of the New in Brackets Economy. And what I'm going to do in it is I'm going to share some stories of women and communities in movement in Colombia, Venezuela and Brazil who have been developing this kind of feminized politics which centers care and solidarity and the politics of social reproduction, so how we reproduce our communities and our lives um, through health, housing, land, food. Um, and then I'm gonna kind of develop um, a feminist political economy emergent from my dialogues with the, these women who are developing feminist political economy and decolonial indigenous kind of critiques of the current economy. 
So just kind of mapping what that might look like and what that might involve. Um, and so, you know, these are tools that we can use wherever we are and in whatever context. But then also just some points about visioning. So what does a feminized um, and why is it important to bring in kind of feminist feminized um, perspectives to vision the new economy in plural? So it's, it's going to be that really. And I mean, I, I don't really like talking to I mean, I know the webinars often we talk and but I really love the dialogue stuff. So I'm, I'm going to try and keep the space so that we really can kind of dialogue its uses or not in terms of thinking about our particular places that we sit in and our particular contexts. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Um, OK, so I'll just share two final things with you. Um, oh, it's saying my screen sharing has failed. It's a bit weird, not a big deal. Um, I'll just try one more time. Okay, so you should now be seeing um, a slide about, um, so Nina is um, running what we call Australia's first national civil society strategy for a new economy. Um, so our hubs all across Australia in a regional perspective and also in a sectoral pers 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 perspective um, are working together to um, come up with key areas and topics and issues that they um, believe are important, um, that they want to take action on. Um, so they'll be focusing on those in their regional and sectoral areas, um, but they'll also be feeding them into Nina's national strategy um, that will then come together and work on across Australia. So what we think collectively across Australia are the most important things um, to help build that momentum and to shape that um, different economy that we're looking for. Um, so whether you're in Newcastle or um, anywhere else across Australia, um, you can be part of the civil society strategy. If there's not already a hub in your area, you can create, create one. Um, that's the beauty of Nina. Um, we're a cooperative and everyone's welcome to join. Um, so we've been connecting the community over the last few months. Um, we've been running vision sessions um, and we're happy to share our visioning approach with you if anyone wants to run that. Um, and now we're starting to define those pathways um, and build those connections further. Um, so in a couple of weeks time, we will be holding a workshop um, around this topic um, for anyone that would like to participate. Um, there will be no cost for that kind of workshop, whether you're Nina or not Nina. Or, um, so that's where I guess we'll build on the ideas and the momentum of today's discussion. Um, and try and drill them down into, well, what would a strategy around that look like? And what would some actions around that look like? Um, and then the beauty of that is that that will go directly into um, our regional hub, but also into that national hub. And if you're in your hub, into yours as well. Um, so I'll send a link about that when I um, email everyone, because I have your email. And if you'd like to participate, do. And if not, no worries. Um, and then I guess just the next final thing um, is to say thank you for joining. Um, we've really appreciated it. I've, it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you so much, Moira, for being my amazing co-host today. Um, and yeah, just to say that if you kind of like what you've heard and, um, and want to be part of the New Economy Network or Smart Citizenry, um, please join. Everyone's welcome. Um, our scope is really broad, um, wherever you're based um, or whatever your passion is, um, we have a space in Nina across all of those different topics. If you're into the repair economy, well-being, you know, right into the economics of it, um, Nina aren't economists, as you've seen, we're just people that think society, um, we, want, we want society to sit above economy and economy to work for the society and not the other way around. Um, so be part of that. So that's the end of the discussion today. Um, so thank you so much. It's been great to have you here. Cool. Alrighty.